Hello everyone and welcome to the lecture today. So today we're going to be talking about um, a very, very uh, interesting idea, which is the idea of limit cycles. And we've already talked about limit cycles in uh, the in-person class. Uh, however, we're going to kind of dive a little bit deeper today into the fundamental mathematical understanding of uh, limit cycles. And we're really just going to focus on theorems 2D. Uh, however, um, limit cycles can appear in any number of dimensions uh, for any number of first order systems, which is why we'll start by just kind of writing down some, some basic notation here. So, specifically, we use our standard system notation. For an ND first order system of differential equations. With a possible initial condition set at T naught. And for our 2D system, we recognize this immediately as Xi1 prime is equal to G1 of Xi1, Xi2, and Xi2 prime is equal to some function G2 of Xi1, Xi2. And all of the ideas in 2D that I'm going to develop and go over uh, can be generalized to 3D and any number of dimensions as well. But when you do that, uh, there are a lot of other things that uh, can possibly go wrong. In 3D, the systems of differential equations can exhibit very, very complex behavior, such as chaos, which we'll get into a little bit later. But, so, we always want to think along the lines of our linearization process from two lectures ago. It's always a good way to start trying to understand things. So let's say we have a point xi star and a point xi, possibly xi of t, the solution to the differential equation on some orbit. You know that we can define the distance vector function h of t as a uh, difference vector as a function of t from xi star to xi. So in 2D, xi star is x star, y star. And xi is equal to xy. The xi notation is convenient for larger systems, but in general, we'll just be talking about x and y in all of the examples today. It's because um, it's a little bit easier to graph and kind of conceptualize. So in the h, the difference vector is xi minus xi star which we can represent in terms of polar coordinates, where r is the radius or the magnitude of h, and r hat is a unit vector, specifically the unit vector cosine of theta, sine of theta. Theta is just the normal angle from the x-axis. You should say the angle from the point, the uh, projection of the x-axis at this point right here, this angle theta right here. And as uh, the solution moves around the curve xi of t, theta and r are both functions of t. They're changing as a function of time or uh, whatever the parameter, uh, the independent variable is. 
capital R and theta are functions of t. Which means that now we know that the magnitude of h squared is equal to r squared. And we know from polar coordinates it's going to be the same thing as x squared plus y squared. So the goal here is going to be to get a system of differential equations that's related to our original first order system of differential equations, um, but uh, depends on r and theta instead of x and y. Um, we can actually use this very often to obtain information about how a solution is traveling and a solution is moving uh, in a given region. The first thing we're going to do is differentiate this implicit relationship. And when we do this, we get that 2 times r times r prime is equal to, oh, and I should be uh, more specific here, this is not is only x squared plus y squared if uh, x star and y star are zero. It's going to be x minus x star squared plus y minus y star squared. So when we differentiate, we get 2 times x minus x star times x prime plus 2 times y minus y star times y prime and um, this is uh, sometimes a little bit more convenient to write down in terms of h where this is going to be 2h 1 prime times or 2h1 times h1 prime plus 2 h2 times h2 prime. And uh, if the point that we're expanding about is the origin, obviously this uh, simplifies just to x and y here. But we want to be careful here and make this as general as possible because uh, this is a very useful method to use if you have a non-zero uh, or non-origin equilibrium point that you want to evaluate or uh, many other possibilities here. But the idea here is that uh, very quickly we see that we can solve for r prime as h1 over r times h1 prime plus h2 over r times h2 prime. And since h1 is x minus x star, which is r cosine theta, h2 is y minus y star, which is our sine theta. h1 prime is equal to x prime and h2 prime is equal to y prime or g1 of xy g2 of xy R prime is going to be equal to cosine of theta times g1 of r cosine theta r sine theta where we have to plug in for x and y into whatever the uh, function g1 is the right hand side of the x derivative equation plus h2 over r, g2 
is sine of theta times g2 of r cosine theta r sine theta and this differential equation looks a little bit more complicated than the differential equation for x but uh, for many systems uh, this will provide this uh, with a great deal of simplification uh, I'll show an example of this in a little bit but our system is incomplete if we have two first order systems in cart Cartesian coordinates for x and y we're going to have uh, two first order uh, differential equations for our polar coordinate system which is essentially what we're doing here we're just converting the polar coordinates about the point xi star and so first we recognize that the angle theta is related to x and y through the tangent function which is just oops that should be the other way around y over x which in terms of h is h2 over h1 so again if we differentiate we obtain secant squared of theta times theta prime by the chain rule and by the quotient rule this will be h2 prime times h1 minus h2 times h1 prime divided by h1 prime or h1 itself squared which looks a little bit more complicated until we realize and kind of break down what everything is here. Uh, remember secant squared is the same thing as 1 over cosine squared. So this equation is the equation we solve for theta prime Theta prime is equal to cosine squared of theta times h1, which is r cosine of theta times h2 prime minus r sine of theta, which is h2 times h1 prime all divided by r squared cosine squared of theta because the denominator is h1 squared and we see this really cool thing happen where cosine squareds cancel out and r over r squared is 1 over r so theta prime is just going to be equal to cosine of theta over r times h2 prime which is the same thing as g2 of x times g2 of r cosine theta r sine theta and minus sine of theta over r times g1 and then r cosine of theta plugged into that r sine of theta plugged into that. And there you 
have it. In general, this new system of differential equations is a system of differential equations that describes uh, trajectories of our differential equation um, relative to some fixed point. But the idea is that uh, typically, you know, we're going to be end up using this to uh, uh, kind of characterize uh, really what's going on uh, around a given a given equilibrium point. We know we know how to classify stability uh, versus saddle point versus um, all of the different classifications in two D. Uh, but in some sense, there's much more behavior that can occur, much more complicated behavior that can occur for nonlinear systems. Um, and this is exactly what we're getting to, which is the concept of a limit cycle. And we're going to see that this idea is very, very important for analyzing these. Uh, I guess that the best way of seeing that is probably to consider a specific example. Uh, this is a very, very nice example that can be found in the Kelly book. So we'll take for our system, xi is xy. We'll take the xi dot or xi prime to be x dot y dot is the function x plus y minus x times x squared plus y squared and the function negative x plus y minus y times x squared plus y squared. And there are a number of different ways of proving that the only equilibrium point of this system uh, is going to be the, uh, the origin, 0, 0. Um, but uh, hopefully you can clearly see that we'll at least have one equilibrium point for the system, which is psi star equals 0, 0. And if you go through and use Desmos, say, to plot the null lines of this differential equation, you see very clearly that uh, as long as the asymptotic behavior of each one of these null lines is consistent with this plot, very clearly the only equilibrium point is the origin here. Uh, there are different ways uh, of proving this, but I won't go over that uh, right now. <coughs> the idea though is that um, if you say, take a second to evaluate the sign of the derivative in each one of these regions, and this is a very important idea in what's Going to be to follow, which is the Poincare Bendixson theorem, after I finish covering this example. And it's related to the idea of invariant regions discussed uh, in the previous lecture. So, for any point here, the only possible direction the point can go is in this direction, this direction, you know, within this range of angles, because the x prime must be negative, so it must be decreasing, and y prime must also be negative. So the direction of solution here is forced to go in a specific direction by the, the null clients. Similarly, in this region, x prime is positive, but y prime is negative. Which means the solution direction is forced to be in number any uh, angle here in the fourth quadrant relative to any one of these points.
Likewise here, x prime is positive and y prime is positive. Which leads to any solution having to have a tangent vector that looks points in this direction right here. And similarly, in this region right here, X, negative, x prime is negative and y prime is positive, so the solution direction can only point in uh, this range of angles right here. And what, what's interesting here though is that if we kind of move down into this uh, region where the um, alkaline has some weird behavior, these directions also has to have to be preserved. Means if we go right here, these directions are the directions that have to have to hold for the solution. If I say go right here to this point right here. These are the directions that have to hold for the solution. If we go right here, these are the directions that have to hold the solution. And lastly, if I go to this region right here, these are the directions that I pulled this through. And so what this is giving us then is it's giving us a fairly clear indication, just the no-cline picture alone, of what's going to be going on with uh, general solutions. Um, just by kind of thinking about this picture that I've kind of graphed for you, uh, we almost immediately expect that this is going to be an unstable critical point but the solution is somehow going to be forced to stay around this critical point right here. And sure enough, we can go through and show, show this exactly. This is going to be our first big example, a uh, good, very good example of a limit cycle. And we'll uh, prove that this has a limit cycle and why it has a limit cycle uh, before we show any plots of this um, to show that we can go through and do this. Jacobian matrix, first and foremost, we'll evaluate at this critical point. But if we go through and evaluate the Jacobian matrix of our system, it becomes negative 3x squared minus y squared plus 1, 1 minus 2xy, negative 2xy minus 1, and negative x squared minus is 3y squared plus 1. At the one critical point, this matrix we'll call A, and it has a relatively nice form. It is 1, 1, negative 1, 1. And so the trace is 2, and the determinant is also 2. 1 times 1 minus negative 1 times 1. Because both of these are positive, we conclude that point zero zero is an unstable equilibrium point. So we've shown what we suspected from this picture uh, that uh, 
zero zero is not in stable equilibrium point. And now if we uh, rely on using the work that we did over here in deriving our system and polar coordinates, remember this is the, the, the deviation system, the system of differential equations that governs the, governs the deviation from any point uh, xi star in polar coordinates centered at that point xi star. So that is a very convenient system to use because the, the system that we've chosen to analyze only has one equilibrium point and this is at the origin at zero zero. Oh, and we'll, we'll just abbreviate this as R G of R theta G one of R theta G one of R theta I don't, want, I don't want to get confused if you have to end up using these equations um, and plugging into a, a problem that is not centered at the origin. Uh, you can still use everything that we did before. You just have to uh, mind the fact that x's and y's have to be shifted uh, by the, the critical point itself. So I'll probably go back and plug this in there, over there as well, just to keep the notes consistent. But I just want I want to emphasize that if uh, x star and y star are non-zero, when you plug in for uh, x and y here, you have to make sure uh, that you, you do this shifting right here. Because uh, if um, x minus x star is equal to r cosine theta, for instance, you have to plug in for x here, x star plus r cosine theta. Uh, this is a very important point to make. I just wanted to make sure that I, I emphasize that. In this problem, it doesn't really matter because uh, x star, y star is zero. But uh, for problems where x star, y star is non-zero, uh, you have to do that um, correct uh, substitution. So anyway, when we, when we substitute each one of these things in, and I make a copy of our G function, just for reference. And also remember that X is R cosine theta, Y is R sine theta. So we'll consider r prime first, and then theta prime. r prime is cosine of theta times r cosine theta plus sine theta minus, and when I plug in here, I get r cubed times cosine of theta. As x is r cosine theta, and x squared plus y squared is just r squared. And this has to be added then to 
sine of theta times negative r, or r times negative, rather, cosine theta plus sine theta, because x is r cosine theta, y is r sine theta, minus r cubed sine of theta. And it's starting to look a little bit complicated until you realize that um, when you do this, these multiplications out, you'll get cosine theta times sine theta here times r, which cancels with negative r cosine theta sine theta here. So ultimately these, this term cancels with this term right here. And for the other term, uh, something really special happens, you get r prime is equal to r times cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta. And this one is going to be negative r cubed cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta, which is 1 and 1. You get that r prime is equal to r minus r cubed, or r times 1 minus r squared, which is completely decoupled from theta. But simultaneously we do have to uh, solve the theta equation now. And I'll let you go through and verify what the theta differential equation is going to be, um, but I, we are going to use it, so I'll, I will plug it in here. Um, sure enough, when you go through and do this, you end up getting that uh, d theta dt, or theta prime, Simplifies even more than the R equation does. Simplifies down to negative 1. And so now we have actually a relatively, you know, very straightforward uh, system that we can go through. We can go through and solve. We can solve for R as a function of theta. And if you want to go through this separable differential equation for R here as a function of T, um, so you integrate 1 over r times 1 minus r squared dr. This is going to be equal to the integral of dt. And you can go there and solve for r as a function of t, and likewise theta as a function of t. It's just going to be negative a, negative t, plus some constant c. Because the uh, initial angle, likewise, when you integrate this, you'll get that r of t is equal to natural log of r. minus one half natural log of one minus r squared. This is gonna be t plus some constant t. However, uh, you know, and this is, this is very interesting, right? That this is a solvable example. Uh, so you can actually go through and check uh, numerical solutions. However, uh, in some sense, this isn't entirely the point. What we want to look at here is how to take this differential equation itself and determine some properties about what's happening with solutions without even going through the solution procedure. Um, you know, I definitely recommend being uh, you know, familiar with and understanding how to go through and, and, and uh, 
do this for simple examples. So we really want to get at the uh, the, the main point uh, in all of this, and the idea here is that just using the differential equations here, this is this new system of differential equations for R and theta, we can say that well, if there's not going to be any equilibrium points because theta is always non-zero, or theta, theta prime is always non-zero. Um, however, there is an R null climb. The R null climb is when r prime is equal to zero, which only happens when r equals zero, which is at the point zero zero, which is an uh, unstable equilibrium point. But r prime is also zero on the radius, which is when r is positive 1. And r is always is positive, uh, so we don't need to include the negative root of this 1 minus r squared. This r equals 1 is a nice, a uh, circle of radius 1. And what we're seeing is that r prime is equal to zero for each point on this circle of radius one. So trajectories that intersect this circle are staying in the circle. The radius is not changing. However, theta is, is constantly changing because it's constantly moving around. This is exactly the limit cycle for this problem. And we predicted that without even going through and solving the, the differential equation for R. Um, and this method will always be able to give you some, some insight into uh, this idea. So let's go through and take a look at what these limit cycles look like. If we plot is trajectories in the phase plane for t from 0 to 1. Sure enough, we see that the solution starts to spiral in. And if we plot the trajectories from 0 to 10, You very strongly see that this limit cycle behavior is appearing exactly on that circle that we predicted using the differential equation. And perhaps the uh, the best way of viewing this is to go to the animation. So I opened up uh, our Python code from earlier and I added the feature into it to produce a bunch of, uh, save a bunch of images to put them into an animation. And this animation looks like the following. So you can very clearly see all of those points evolving uh, with any given distribution evolving onto that limit cycle. So this is really cool. This phenomena can be understood in a number of different ways, but primarily um, there are a couple big theorems that uh, we can use here. And the idea is that it's related to the, um, the language introduced before of positively invariant sets and the omega limit sets of um, a, given, uh, a given, given differential equation over there.
in general, the problem of finding cycles is difficult. In the previous example, we were able to use polar coordinates to find the periodic solution, but it's not always as uh, nice and smooth as that last example. Um, the fundamental result that we can use for general 2D systems is called the Poincaré Bendixson theorem. And for this theorem, we're going to be considering a system of nonlinear differential equations in 2D. And this has the following. So consider star, and I want to make a emphasis that this is for n equals 2 if psi of t comma of psi of t comma beta is a bounded orbit positive t and w is its omega limit set as defined in the last lecture then either one of the following is true. W is a cycle or limit cycle, or for each point y in w, the omega limit set of psi of t comma y is a set of one or more equilibrium points. And the proof of this is actually very technical. So much so that it's not in the, the, the book. Um, uh, in the book, uh, they give a rough sketch of uh, how to prove it. Uh, so you can get an idea of why it's true. But um, the full proof can be found in the text by Hirsch and Small. The reference is fully in the, uh, the Kelly book. And the, the main idea is that um, if you can go through and uh, bound 
uh, so you, you use the fact that if you can bound the solution in uh, in invariant uh, region, um, uh, either one of these two things has to be true. So, um, in some sense, we already showed with this phase plane diagram right here, uh, the basic idea of uh, how you would in a more advanced way go through and actually prove this uh, general theorem. And it very strongly relies on constructing a positively invariant region um, surrounding uh, a given uh, region that you're interested in. So let's go through and see how uh, to use this for a slightly more complicated example um, that's related to the previous problem, but a little bit more complicated than the previous problem. And this example is going to be, we'll consider the derivative of x is x plus y minus x times x squared plus 2y squared and y prime is negative x plus y minus y times x squared plus 2y squared. A small change, but a change that nonetheless will make the polar form a little bit more cumbersome to use. However, using the uh, differential equation in the polar form and the point by Mendelssohn theorem you still can go through a way and get a very nice idea of what's going to happen um, and show that there has to be a limit cycle uh, for this problem. So this is the main change here. Uh, we still have one equilibrium point uh, of our system. And if you go through and do the method that I showed earlier, um, the differential equation in polar form ends up simplifying down directly to the following. And I'm not going to go through the calculations here. However, it'd be good for you to go through and show just for practice. You get r prime is equal to r minus r cubed times 1 plus sine squared of theta you still do get a relatively nice differential equation for theta but this now is a coupled nonlinear system of uh, differential equations still use this, even if you can't go through and directly solve this um, um, in the following way. So we note that uh, on the circle uh, r equals one half r prime is one half minus one eighth times one plus sine squared of theta
which will always be the maximum of sine theta is 1. And because we have a negative sign right here, we want to focus on this maximum because uh, if we uh, you know, we know that sine squared theta is maximum when sine is 1, um, so then the minimum value of this expression right here is when theta is, is 0, or it's when uh, sine of theta is 1, um, so then we get 1 plus 1, which is 2 over 8, or 1 over 4. So the minimum value of r prime on r equals 1 half is 1 half minus 1 fourth, which is positive. Then we know that the equilibrium point is an unstable equilibrium point. And it's just shown that on r equals one half, the radius is always changing positively across it. So the solution is entering into the region outside of this circle. Radius r equals one half. Likewise, uh, if we look at a slightly larger radius, radius of 1.1. .1, You did the same procedure. I'll end up getting that r prime is 1.1 minus 1.331 times 1 plus sine squared of theta. And uh, the maximum value for this is going to be when sine squared of theta is zero, or sine of theta is zero. And so, this will be less than or equal to 1.1 minus 1.331, which is negative. So this is circle radius one half. Look at circle radius one point one now, and we're seeing that solutions on this circle that enter into this circle have a negative change in R. And so this region right here, this annular region, is uh, an invariant region, positively invariant region uh, for this system of differential equations. And therefore, by the Poincare Bendixson theorem, because there are no equilibrium points inside this region D, By the point for Edmundixon theorem, there must be a limit cycle. In D. Now, in this example, um, this annual, invariant annular region has the property that all orbits that intersect it must inter enter into the region, into the region itself. Uh, but in some cases, a portion of the boundary may be invariant. So uh, we'll see how to deal with this in a second. Uh, however, I do want to show um, 
uh, visualization okay, of the solution curves for this example. This is a picture of the annular region described before. Um, it's a positive linear region. And if we uh, see a plot of the trajectories here, we can very clearly see um, why we chose the annual region that we did. Because it traps uh, this limit cycle inside of it. And you see very clearly that uh, the solutions that are close to the equilibrium point here at the intersection of the north lines are moving away from the equilibrium point and the solution uh, for initial conditions that are outside of this annual region are moving in to this uh, this limit cycle and the limit as t goes to infinity 